Okay, uh, Deep, you have your hand up. Um, you have a query? Yes, sir. Yeah. Um, sir, uh, quite a few lectures ago, uh, when we were discussing about the cell, mem uh, cell membrane and like the membranes of different uh, organelles, mm -hmm. you had shown a picture that showed that the membrane was quite different from each other. Mm -hmm. Like the organellar membrane were different. But yes. here, each and every membrane is very interacting. Like it's interacting a lot with each other. Yes. For example, membrane of Golgi and membrane of the plasma membrane is very different. Right. But like the membrane of Golgi is only going and attaching itself as vesicles in the... What is common cell. between those membranes? I mean, yeah, lipid bilayer is common. Yeah, it's a big so, commonality, right? See, yes. uh, the thing here is that, um, you know, obviously each of these components, each of these mem endomembrane systems uh, will have differences in uh, the organization of their membrane. Uh, that in part, for example, when we come to the Golgi and we look at each compartment of the Golgi, we'll also see that um, between compartments, there could be differences in, in the composition of the membrane. It's not fully known, uh, you know, what extent of difference there is, but there could be some lipids that are very unique to certain compartments. Um, and this may be vital for many reasons. One, um, they could um, influence, for example, the architecture of the membrane. Uh, they could also uh, play an important role in allowing proteins, for example, that are part of the membrane to work and function in a, uh, in a certain unique way. Uh, but the critical thing in all of this is that uh, the fact that they are lipids um, is allowing uh, for these membranes to talk to each other in a way that would have been very difficult otherwise um, had they all not had this um, feature of being made up of lipids. So yes, the composition could be different. Um, and for example, when a vesicle gets delivered to the plasma membrane, once it integrates into the plasma membrane, um, these lipids also now move around, right? And, and uh, it will get diluted in the sea of lipids that's at the plasma membrane. Um, and so this eventually, um, you know, kind of um, regularizes, if I may call it that, uh, to become the composition that is the plasma membrane, right? So, so it's, uh, one of the ways to think about uh, distinguishing these compartments um, is also these small subtle differences that exist. So there are a lot of lipids that will be common, that will be present in most lipid membranes, but there will be some lipids which will be unique to certain compartments. Right? Okay. Um, Varda, your query. Varad, Lele. Varad, sorry. Yeah. yeah. So in the video that we have seen so many times, of the cell, mm -hmm. uh, it was shown that the mitochondria keeps moving between the cytoskeleton and the cytoskeletal component uh, determine what shape the mitochondria will take and it is very right. right. right? Uh, so is the Golgi apparatus also have a very varying shape or it right. is yes. The... yes, actually they do, you know, and I'll show you some images in the coming lecture. Um, particularly, you know, we study the Golgi in my lab in the context of cells uh, um, when they are adherent versus when the cells are detached, right? Um, and, and there is a very dramatic reorganization of the Golgi. Um, and the really interesting thing is that reorganization of the Golgi happens almost entirely dependent on the microtubule network, right? So the Golgi opens up and the really interesting thing is when it opens up, all the pieces of the Golgi are actually moved apart, right, um, along the microtubule tracks. So when we take a suspended cell and then we plate it back, right, and the cell attaches, um, this all these Golgi pieces that have floated away all come back, you know, into a compact structure. And that coming back happens along the microtubule tracks. So if we break up the Golgi by detaching a cell and all the components disperse, Right? And then we break the microtubules and then ask the Golgi to come back again by replating the cell. You know what happens? Nothing comes back. Right? So, so you're right in thinking about this uh, this way that um, these components are all um, tied to the Golgi. Many of the motor proteins that we talked about um, are actually vital in keeping the Golgi components uh, you know, right next to each other as well. Right? And I'm not going to uh, get, getting into the detail of how this is regulated, but motor proteins and cytoskeletal elements are very vital uh, for the architecture 
um, and functionality of uh, many of these endomembrane components. Right? Okay, sir. Thank you. Ajinkya, please go ahead, Ajinkya. Yes, sir. Am I audible? Yes, 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 absolutely. So, so my question is that uh, when the transport vesicle reaches the plasma membrane, how does it open up? Can you just mm -hmm. Okay, so um, there is a very elaborate mechanism that is in place, right? Uh, see, because it's not that trivial to fuse one lipid membrane to another lipid membrane. Right. And, um, uh, you know, it's an, uh, uh, because you raised it, I'm discussing this right now. Uh, but there are you know, a set of proteins um, which are actually part of the plasma membrane and part of the vesicle as well that allow for one docking because there has to be binding first. So there are two events here. Right. The vesicle could keep floating around and keep bumping on the membrane. It needs a place to kind of go stick to. Right, and that sticking to the plasma membrane is, uh, you know, can be mediated by proteins that ensure that a vesicle gets delivered to a very specific site at the plasma membrane. And once that, uh, you know, binding happens, um, and there is a class of proteins, uh, you know, called uh, the exocyst uh, complex, which is, um, you know, a group of proteins that are present on the vesicle, some are present on the plasma membrane, and they bind and allow for this kind of docking to take place. Um, and then there are proteins that essentially uh, try and um, pinch the two membranes in such a way that the, um, you know, the distance between the two membranes is actually reduced as much as possible. So they pinch them in such a way that now they fuse. And now, you know, you have, you know, the vesicle opens up and you have this entire membrane that, uh, you know, it, it gets, the membrane of the vesicle gets integrated into the membrane of the plasma membrane. And um, this is also uh, the case when, uh, when membranes have to be pinched off. So if you have to make a vesicle and kind of pull it off from the membrane as well, you need to be able to bring the two membranes, uh, you know, of that uh, vesicle really close to each other, right? And, and after a certain proximity, you know, the uh, the lipids uh, now, uh, the, en the inherent energy of the lipids will allow them to fuse together in such a way that now you have a vesicle um, and, and the lipids uh, that are on the plasma membrane have fused to kind of create um, a, a clean seal for the plasma membrane and the vesicle is here, right? Um, and, and, you know, that's only possible uh, by bringing them, uh, you know, together. So uh, the cytoskeleton obviously plays a role, but there are proteins that by themselves can, you know, create ring-like structures that will, uh, you know, squeeze the membrane sufficiently such that the two uh, bilayers are close enough to allow for this to happen. Okay, so, um, so it is a, a very interesting, um, you know, uh, regulatory system. Um, and, um, and there are many proteins actually involved that allow, uh, you know, for that to happen. Okay, but it's a good question. Good question. Yeah. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Um, there are a couple of questions on the chat box that I'm going to try and take. Um, just give me a minute. Mm. Let me see if there is anything. Everything is about bidirectionality. Um, somebody has asked a question. Anand has a question saying, can motor proteins walk on the lower part or sides of the microtubules? We saw in animation that they walk on the top side. Yeah, so absolutely they can, right? So remember that, um, you know, you cannot think of this space um, as being regulated, um, you know, like we would walk on a, Beam. Um, I think uh, for us, gravity uh, plays a very important role in making sure we uh, we are pulled down. Uh, but remember, this is um, in a cytosol, which is a fairly viscous environment, right? And and that's also the reason why uh, you know such a big vesicle can be carried by like this tiny uh, motor protein, right? Uh, because this vesicle is 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 not heavy; it's floating around, um, and and this thing just has to you know drag it around. Um, I think um, zero gravity, you know, we see this all the time uh, that uh, because of the lack of gravity, you know, very heavy, big objects uh, can be moved by one person around. Um, and it's only possible because, you know, they inherently don't have any weight in zero gravity. And so now moving these around become easy, right? So, so the motor proteins will be able to walk if you have a microtubule strand, uh, um, you know, like this, they will be able to walk on all sides of the microtubule, right? And so, so it's, um, it's possible there are motor proteins walking this way, this way, this way, 
all, all possibilities, uh, you know, can exist. Um, do we, Hirak has a query, do we need less bidirectional motor proteins than unidirectional? I'm not sure I understand the question uh, by what do you mean by less, but you know, you need less of uh, by less number of less number of yeah so that is true right um that um uh, you know what you are in you have to make two kinds of motor proteins uh, you know rather than uh, you know imagining a situation where you have only five of one uh, and they can go in both direction now you need five that go in one direction five in the other so to speak so so somebody else raised it too that um, you need to make more proteins to be able to do this and and there is definitely a, a cost factor involved there right if you have to make 10 proteins instead of five but um, what you're gaining in 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 um, in terms of specificity, in terms of accuracy, in terms of uh, being less error prone uh, in, in unidirectionality, um, I think might allow, uh, you know, to say that it's worth the cost uh, of having two sets of motor proteins, right? Uh, can the cargo tell bidirectional motor protein in which direction it wants to go? So that's another possibility, right? It's possible that uh, the cargo itself has uh, a regulatory mechanism that can talk to the uh, motor protein to say, you know, now let's um, switch direction, which will be very cool uh, if, if it's able to do it, right? But um, yeah, at this point of time, we don't know um, of such a mechanism. Um, and it's also not very clear, even with classical motor proteins, uh, whether just the binding of the cargo can initiate a motor proteins walk, right? Uh, for the most part, it's thought that motor proteins, as long as they have energy, will have a walk, um, and, you know, in the process, pick up things as they go along, right? In some cases, um, you know, they may be um, attached uh, to the, uh, the vesicle to begin with, uh, and then, uh, you know, be, uh, begin uh, to make their walk as well, okay? 